Okay, this screencast is about diversity and the measurement of species diversity. So, diversity can be measured as species richness, which is simply the number of species. Um, that would be like a list, right, um, of species. And so you could say, oh, there's 15 species. So that's great, but a lot of times um, species diversity actually includes the concept of relative abundance. And I should mention as we start this that, um, you know, when you measure diversity, you also sort of have to define it. And so there are a lot of ways of defining what it is. Um, and that's, that's okay. Um, what I'm going to do here is make a drawing so you can sort of see what we're thinking about when we're defining species. This becomes species rank. And I'm going to put species on this axis down here. I'm going to put species A, species B, species C, and species D, and species E down here. Okay. And then I'm going to have up here the frequency of each of those species. So essentially a community could look like this, um, where there's mostly species A and some species B and a little bit of C and a little bit of D and a little bit of E. Okay. An alternative way a community could look is that uh, the same graph might look like this. A, B, C, D, E. Um, now, the difference between these is a thing called evenness. And, and that is that, as you can see, um, oh, let's call this... Um, Um, let's call this group, um, I'll call it group A and group B, just for simplicity here, right? So community A is the first one, um, and then we have community B, right? Um, you can see that community A is five species. They both have the same number of species, so the species diversity is the same. And yet, pretty clearly, there's a difference in these communities. Now, most people sort of intrinsically or sort of innately will look at this and decide that this is a more diverse over here, group B. And uh, the, the reason we look at that, and, and, and again, this is part of the place where we define diversity, and maximum evenness has, a, uh, has some nice properties to it. One of the things is if you imagine that you're collecting um, flowers out of a community or something, say you're going to an alpine field and you're going to pick up flowers, um, these rare ones are very, then group A over here, these rare species are unlikely to be picked up, right? And if you pick up one of them, you're unlikely to pick up another one. Um, uh, in the other community, you're, so you're picking up a sample, so if you picked up a sample of 10 things, you would probably get you know, at least five different species there, uh, or at least all five. And, but if you pick 10 things out of group A, you might not you might not get all five species, right? You might only get two species. So, um, you know, for this reason, sort of this, the idea of, uh, of diversity is, is entwined with this idea of evenness of each of the number of species. So we call that, uh, I'm just going to write that, evenness. So um, if we have a large community, you would take this, and instead of making bars like this, you would still call this species rank on the, on the horizontal axis and the frequency. And this might be the abundance of species in samples. And you might have a drawing that looks something like this. You could have a whole bunch of species and each of their abundances in there. Um, alternatively, another community might look more evenly distributed. It might do like this. It's always declining. It should be declining this line because you're ranking the species from most abundant um, to least abundant. Right, so it goes down. And so you could imagine a number of different shapes of curves that could come out of these things. And this is, these are called species abundance distributions. Uh, the way they're drawn here, we call them rank abundance distribution. Now this rank abundance distribution has most of the information that you need to know about the community. And it really tells you about all the relative abundance of each of the species, and it tells you how many species there are. And you can compare communities by looking at them, but you can look at them and compare them, but you can't really quantitatively compare two rank abundance distributions. They're hard to compare, um, you know, from a statistical or quantitative perspective. So what we'll often try to do is create what's called a diversity index. And I'm going to move up back here. And an index is a, uh, is a, to re reduces the uh, rank abundance distribution to a number. 
that can then be compared among communities. And the way that we do that is uh, we try to come up with an index that will increase uh, with species richness. And it should also increase with evenness. So that a maximum uh, diversity would be a lot of species evenly distributed. Right? Um, one way to do this is ask about the probability of getting uh, of taking a random sample of two. Take a random sample of two individuals and then ask what is the probability uh, they are the same. They are the same species. Um, now, the reason we do this is because you can see, I mean, I kind of gave this idea, um, you know, one of the, of, of looking at diversity as this, um, the probability of encounter, encountering the same thing twice, right? So the probability of getting two of a kind in a sample of two does give you some indication about the shape of this distribution. So um, one of the ways of doing that, so the calculating that is to look at how many different ways are there to get two of a kind? You can get, and the way that there are in these five things, you can get two A's, two B's, two C's, two D's, and two F's, right? Those are the only ways. If you add all those ways together, then that is all the ways of getting two of a kind, right? And if we take that number, um, we can add up, so the probability of getting two of species A as you go back up there, is equal to, has something to do with this frequency of species A, right? It's the frequency of species A times the frequency of species A. That's because you're going to draw one, and then drawing the next one is an independent sample, so it, it is the same probability the second time. So the probability of getting an A is equal to the frequency of A, which is the percent representation of A in the population, times uh, the, the frequency of A. So it turns out to be is equal to the frequency of a uh, frequency of a squared. So you add the for b is the same thing. It's the frequency of b uh, times the frequency of b. So that is equal to the frequency of b squared. All right, and we can continue on down here. So basically. You can get two of a kind of type A, two of a kind of type B, two of a kind of type C, two of a kind of type D, two of a kind of type E. And you add all those probabilities together, and that is a probability of getting two of a kind, because that is an entire sample space of getting two of a kind. Um, so what we can do with that information, then, um, is, and I'm going to reduce this formula down a little bit, what this really means, then, if I let P equals the frequency P sub I equal the frequency of species I, right? Then what I have is P sub I squared. So I have basically for each of the species, right? So um, P is a frequency again, and I is the label. So I've got I of 1 through 5, right? So that's the me that uh, basically I'm going to have I'm going to look at it this way. I'm going to have p of a squared, p of b squared, plus p of c squared, plus p of d squared, plus p of e squared, right? So I'm going to add all those together, and that's going to give me the total probability of getting two of a kind. Um, let's take a look at that in practice and see how that works. I'm going to use a really simplified community to do this. This is the best way of doing this. I'm still going to put frequency over here, but I'm going to compare a community that is... 90% species A and 10% species B. And I'm going to compare that to a community that is a 50-50 community of A and B. Okay. So when I do that, I can see that when I go into the first case over here, and this is going to be community A and this will be community B, that um, the probability of getting two A's probability of two A's is equal to uh, 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 equals 0.81. And the probability of getting two B's is equal to 0.1 times 0.1, which is equal to 0.01. And 
Now notice how much smaller they get. So tiny numbers here that are much less than one get exponentially smaller. That's the effect of squaring. And numbers that are close to one don't get that much smaller when you square them, right? So those, all that added together is 0.82. So that's the probability of drawing two of the same, and it's actually pretty high. If we do it for this next group over here, it's going to be um, probability of two A's is going to be equal to 0.5 times 0.5 equals 0.25, and probability of getting two B's will be 0.5 times 0.5 is also equal to 0.25. Add those together, we get 0 0.50. So that means the probability of two of a kind there is actually less. So in even communities, um, it is less likely to get two of a kind. in a random sample of two individuals. Okay, um, so this is a good diversity, and you know, this is going to change, right? This thing changes with evenness. The problem is that it goes the wrong direction. So the probability of getting two of a kind goes up as the community gets less diverse, right? So this is like less diverse here, right? So we can use this measure, though, um, and we can use the complement of it. So we can take the complement and we can ask, what is the probability of getting two different species? Now, it's a little bit harder to calculate all the combinations. There's a lot of ways of doing it. The easy way of doing that is taking 1 minus probability of getting two of a kind. And that's because you either get two of a kind in a draw of two or you don't. So there's, that's the entire probability space. So that equals the probability of getting two different species in a draw of two. And now this number, because these are complements here, right, this number goes up with evenness instead of down. And it also goes up with the number of species. So it has the right properties. Um, in your statistics that you are calculating, lambda is equal to, has been given a name, lambda is the probability of getting two of a kind, and one minus lambda is the probability of two different species in a draw of two. So this is what's called the uh, Gini-Simpson index. Okay, and the lambda here becomes like a measure of concentration, they call it. So lambda becomes pretty important because it has this intuitive property of being the probability of drawing two of the same things, and then the complement of that, of course, being two of a kind. So this is how diversity indices work, um, that the more uneven a community becomes, the more likely it is you'll draw two different things. And so this can range from zero to one, this uh, Gini Simpson index, and it has a has some nice properties that way. Now, it's important to consider that a diversity index does not allow you to recreate the structure of the community. So there are multiple ways of getting the same value between zero and one. So you can have a lot of species that are fairly rare or a few that are fairly common. And both of those results can give you the same diversity number or the index value. So because of that, we have to put a little bit of caution out there that you don't necessarily have the ability to rebuild the entire system. There are two major diversity indices. There's another one called the Shannon Wiener, which does something very similar. We just did the uh, Gini Simpson. I'm going to write it out for you because it was essentially the sum of the PI squareds. Um, from i equals 1 to s, right, of all the species, um, and it was 1 minus that, right, because pi squared, sum of pi squared is probably getting two of a kind, and this is the probability of uh, getting two different. 
the Shannon index is the negative sum from i equals 1 to s of pi, again, same frequency, times the natural log of pi. So this turns out to be very similar, and it's what it really does. It doesn't have the same intuitive property, but it does, it does sort of result in evenness, making a higher diversity index. And so essentially this is the, these numbers that are less than, are all less natural log of numbers that are frequencies that are less than one, the natural log of those things is all negative. So you take the negative of that to get the answer. And so either one of these is a very good diversity index to use. The Shannon Wiener has some properties that are kind of nice. Um, one thing that's nice about it is you can calculate a thing called the effective, let's do this, the effective number of species. And you can do this with the Genie Simpson too, it's just not that easy. The effective number of species uh, can be calculated as e to the h prime. This is, uh, they call this h prime. All right, so if you exponentiate that in Excel, that's an EXP of whatever the H prime is, the value of Shannon. Um, what you get are the number of equally abundant species, um, equally abundant species, so perfectly even species um, that give that diversity. Uh, so your Shannon index can range you know, from like zero to seven or something like that. And what happens in this case is say you get a number of like 3.2, then you can calculate how many equally abundant species and your sample might look like this, but you could calculate how many equally abundant species would give you the same uh, number. And maybe it's something like four equally abundant species. So this becomes the effective number of species, and this is also called a true diversity by Jost, and hopefully Jost will be visiting us in class. And um, But the number of equally abundant species that give you the same diversity value. So that's a really nice uh, trait to have in a, in a diversity index. Um, you can also use that to calculate you can also calculate H max, which is given the number of species um, if all species in your sample were even, right? If they were all even, so if they all look like that, well, that would be pretty impressive. And so that's H max. So what you can do is you can put H prime that you have over H max and that is a proportion of how even you are compared to how even you could be, right? So h prime over h max is also a valuable number because you can you can determine how um, how much your sample deviates from perfect evenness, right? How much it falls short. So that's going to be pretty good for now for the diversity indices. And what we'll do is. Uh, We'll try to work on, uh, do another short video on how to measure alpha and beta diversity.